Falls ich sprechen, weißt du, wenn ich spreche. Well, welcome everyone. Um, tanga koto katoa. No America ho no te tema tanga. Ko te tai toku manga. Ko waitaki toku awa. Ko ota tahi toku kainga inai nei. E roe a toku tunga mahi o Perryfield Lawyers. Ko Stephen Ma toku ingwa. No re la nami hi kia koto katoa. It's really wonderful to welcome you all to this evening's function. I'm really excited to have you here. And we're going to be looking at a really interesting topic with a diverse range of speakers. So I'm really looking forward to it. And we're going to hear from different panelists, their perspectives. Um, it is the World Ocean Day, so it's an exciting day to be gathering. Um, and uh, it, the theme is revitalization, collective action for the ocean. Um, just before we get in and underway, um, we've got Yula here. Would you mind coming up and we're going to have um, a little karakia, um, which is um, a welcome from the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies. Thank you. Lavalevo, Stephen. I'll say prayer as an opening up to our um, Events this evening. I remember the Masumanda, let's bow our heads in prayer. The Maito Valamalangi, Venava Neva Mulavamani to a law, my cabinet ua in a song called about the May Eight to Ranga and Meta and Dobby Talano and Balata Muneo Bullet to Ranga Munisol Sulibi Imani, Awasalio. Venava Levo Navi Ake, the Erejo and Abu to Ranga, make a solivir to the divorce and a cabinet ua, Marina Valata in a two Ranga Matate in a Munilangi. Venava Levo Nilavamo. Thank you so much. All right, so um, what we're going to do is have a few people sharing um, to open us some welcoming thoughts and comments. And then we're going to be having um, some panelists who will be up here. And they're each going to share, and we're going to ask them some questions and hear their perspectives, and then be storing up your questions because we'll have some time at the end where you can ask questions as well. Um, so to begin with, it, it's an honor to welcome Martin Holland, the director of the National Center for Research on Europe at the University of Canterbury. So we'd love to welcome you to come and, and share some thoughts with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And, uh, uh, there won't be much, there's no content from me, so you can relax. I just want to welcome you uh, to the National Center for Research on Europe. Uh, I must say, I'm delighted at looking around at all the faces behind the masks. There's only two that I recognize. <laughs> so it's really good to have new people here. Uh, for those of you, which presumably the majority, the National Center for Research on Europe has been going for just over 20 years at the University of Canterbury. And we are, should we say, the, a unique entity in the New Zealand higher education system. And although we're part of the University of Canterbury, we like to think of ourselves really as a, a policy think tank in addressing um, issues, global issues, but obviously from a European Union uh, perspective. And uh, disclosure, full disclosure, uh, the centre has been very good over 20 years to 
the a number of generous grants from the EU for research on whatever topics are relevant uh, to our academics and students. And that totals 10 million euros over that period, which is about 16 million New Zealand dollars. So it's not inconsiderable, put it that way. Tonight's a good example. I mean, this isn't normally uh, an area that we have research capacity, in, but we are intentionally and explicitly interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary to study policy challenges globally, or indeed to understand how the European Union thinks it works, including in the Indo-Pacific. That uh, can only be done through that multidisciplinary approach. And uh, I won't delay the real speakers any longer, but just perhaps alert you to the most recent interest in our region and to global challenges of the European Union. It's called, not a particularly new or novel title, but it's called the Indo-Pacific Strategy, uh, which was launched at the end of 2021 which is a really comprehensive view of how the EU wants to engage in the region uh, across many, many uh, different areas. They list seven, one of which is called ocean governance. So it's not just about free trade or security or uh, democratic values. It's about ocean governance and how the EU can contribute to that in a uh, multilateral international way. So as you can tell, I'm probably, I'm the fraud here today. This isn't my research area at all, uh, but the National Centre of Research in Europe welcomes research that is relevant to our region. Uh, and although we always have to look through our EU lenses to see um, hopefully what the positive contribution might be. Thank you. I'll leave it there. Hey. Well, thank you for that welcome. I did want to acknowledge as well as the people in this room, we have using technology, a lot of people watching through Zoom. So um, welcome to everybody across the world who's out there or who's watching the recording later. Um, I'd like to welcome James Nicotine to come up next. Um, James is the founder and director of Blue Cradle Foundation right here. And he is also the co-chair of the EU for Ocean Platform, EU for Ocean Coalition of the European Commission. And James, we've gotten to know each other over the last few years through the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. Um, and it's just really good to see you're doing this work about the ocean based here in Otatahi Christchurch. So really, um, thank you for coordinating this and would welcome you to come and share your thoughts. Thank you very much, Stephen. Um, I've got a long list of thanks. Uh, I'll try and be brief because we do have a panel um, to get busy with, and I'm really looking forward to it. Tēnā koto katoa, tuarua kina mate haere haere atura. Tēnā koto a nai tuaruriri, nai tahu iwi i nata tangata fenua o tene rohe. Kia tato e tau nei kia ora. Tēnā koto, tēnā koto, tēnā koto katoa. Um, ladies and gentlemen, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight. I'm really so happy uh, to be your co-host um, right here at the National Center for Research on Europe, um, a place that I could call a little bit of Europe right at the bottom of the South Pacific here at the University of Canterbury. So uh, I kind of feel at home here. Um, my name is James Nicotine. Uh, as Stephen introduced uh, me, I'm the founder and executive director of the Blue Cradle Foundation. I am indeed the co-chair of the European um, Commission-led EU for Ocean Platform, which is a coalition, which is one community of a coalition which is um, designed to promote ocean literacy across the European Union member states and beyond. Um, I was actually just recently in Italy at the first EU for Ocean uh, Coalition Summit, uh, part of the European Maritime Day in Ravenna, Italy. Um, I'm a consultant, I'm a filmmaker, and if you want to work with me, let me know because I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm always available. Um, um, first of all, I'd like to thank Martin and his team for welcoming us here tonight uh, and the University of Canterbury for hosting us as well on, sh on such short notice. Um, it's a special day for us at Blue Cradle because we, it's World Ocean Day, of course, and we really strive to um, build on these academic partnerships 
um, where we strive for excellence and uh, events such as these are really important to reinforce that commitment to excellence and to collective action, which is the topic of the day. So revitalization of the ocean and collective action is today's uh, World Ocean Day uh, theme. Uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for accepting our invitation. Um, Yvette Couch-Lewis, um, Dr. Vivian Combo, uh, Anthony Powell, and Stephen Ratuva. Uh, thank you very much for uh, accepting my invitation. I really look forward to hearing about you, you and your work. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Carol much for her presence and support. Thank you so much for being here and, and, and making yourself available. Um, I'd like to thank our partners, the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO for making this event possible, the Christchurch City Council, the Rata Foundation, the Namaste Foundation, and our sponsor, Grove Mill Wines. We will have a little aperitif after this event and I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing a glass of wine with you and some uh, nibbles as well. I would like to thank Stephen Moe for his support and for accepting to moderate this panel tonight. Uh, Stephen, you've been a part of our Blue Cradle journey from the beginning um, and I really want to thank you for it and I hope we can continue um, for many years uh, to come. I want to thank the Edmund Hillary Fellowship uh, that I'm a part of to have opened up their arms and welcomed me in this wonderful country that I can call home, Aotearoa, and to this whānau. Um, finally, I would like to thank our Blue Cradle trustees, our team, and our volunteers. Where's Natasha? Natasha, uh, who's helped me uh, all this way, along this way, and my wife and my family who support me throughout all these after hours and extracurricular work. Nā mihi. Thank you. Um, last but not least, I would like to thank all of you here tonight and all of you over there uh, online for making the effort in joining us tonight. Now, World Ocean Day. Um, mark my words, ocean is singular. There is one ocean and we live on an ocean planet. Um, many sea basins, semi-enclosed and open and um, we live on an ocean planet. 71% of Earth, in fact, is ocean. And that ocean regulates our climate, it regulates our weather, um, it absorbs carbon dioxide, it transports nutrients, currents, enables shipping, fishing, and all the way around, and diving, and lots of things that we do going to the beach and sailing and so on. For billions of us living on this blue marble, it holds up 95% of the life on the planet and approximately 10% of it has been discovered and roughly 20% mapped or explored. Unfortunately though, we are pushing this ocean um, towards collapse. So there are many tipping points, warming, um, we're emptying its fish, we're emptying the biomass. This has devastating consequences for ecosystem species, but also human uh, beings who live and rely on these uh, ecosystems and species. Coral reefs, I'm thinking about, ice sheets, and many unknowns for human populations around the world. Climate change is um, one of our main issues of concern at Blue Cradle, and we are working on, on that project um, to mitigate and, and, and find solutions. Um, this Blue Cradle, as I like to call it, has been responsible for our well being our thriving communities, our societies and nations, but it has also been shaping our identities and, and cultural and, 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 and our historical identities. This knowledge, this very special influence that we have on the ocean and, the, and we continue to have and that the ocean has on us is known as ocean literacy. Um, so it was first defined by the National Marine Educators Association in 2005, and it was then adopted by UNESCO in 2017. Um, ocean literacy through marine science and conservation education is really one of our core objectives at Blue Cradle. And as an organization, we've entered our third year and we're supported by many across the community, the City Council, Environment Canterbury, Rata Foundation, Foundation North, Namaste, the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Littleton Port Company, New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO, and many, many more. And so our role, I think, is pivotal. And it's not only pivotal, it's growing. And I think what we're trying to do and what we did today with the Tamariki at the Antarctic Center, we had a whole day there with young children from five or six different schools, is we are giving them a direction. We're giving them two main things, a direction, a compass, a mountain to climb, a, um, something that could be a promise or something that could, they could discover along the way. Uh, often we think that having goals 
is detrimental or that on the contrary, not having a goal can be a problem. But I think if we at least show them the way, they can make, make up their own mind on, you know, as, as they go. And I think the journey is more important than the destination. And so what really matters is not losing track of your passion and dreams. So at Blue Crater, one of our first objectives is to accompany these audiences, these tamariki, these rangatahi. Um, we can provide them a sense of belonging to this world and a sense that we can make a difference in shaping it together. Um, the second thing they need is reassurance, um, not doom and gloom. So we're not about doom and gloom. We're not about advocacy um, and pointing the finger. We're about working together and collaboration. We believe in the complementarity of knowledge systems by working together, um, integrating uh, different yeah, knowledge systems. We strive to enable knowledge to be passed on, local knowledge, new and old knowledge, and what's known here as Mataoranga Maori, uh, around some of our most pressing environmental challenges. That way we can enable the next generation to be resilient and strong in the face of tomorrow's difficulties. Another one of our core objectives is to influence many different stakeholders, including decision makers that we have a blue path ahead, and that's the right future for our island nation. Our ultimate goal is to transform Aotearoa New Zealand by providing avenues for young people where rewarding and fulfilling careers may wait them, advancing the accessibility of the marine science sector, but also being realistic. Marine biology or oceanography isn't necessarily a pathway to stability. It's quite difficult, but that could change. Influencing the science sector, our goal is to support the blue economy with innovative startups and thriving potential. With 4 million square kilometers, 15 times larger than the land area, New Zealand has a great opportunity. We need to be a leader in that area. And now that we're at the start of the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, we have a unique opportunity to contribute new data, to build new research partnerships and ocean literacy education programs and projects. In the EU, according to the 2022 EU Blue Economy Report, the Blue Economy and its associated industries employs 4.5 million people, generating 667 billion euros in turnover. Inside some of these opportunities, we have R&D research, smart green ports, sustainable aquaculture, automated shipping, hydrogen, as well as carbon capture and storage and regenerating ecosystems and species, reefs, marine protected areas as well. Um, there are many innovative and positive developments that include marine protected areas under the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, with a commitment to nature-based solutions, ecosystem-based management approaches. Um, what we need to do is to follow that model and adopt some of the things that are happening around the world. And I think that's what we're contributing to is to scaling up this, this uh, sector. Um, one area that we are working in is marine invasive species. And we happen to be working on this subject in a few months. We'll be working in French Polynesia um, with the support of the Center for Island Research and Environmental Observatory in Morea with our partners there. So we look forward to inviting New Zealand, Pacific, and European partners to these exciting workshops. Um, as New Zealand is entering the formal negotiation of the association agreement with Horizon Europe, the biggest EU research and innovation program ever, with more than 90 billions in funding available over seven years between 2021 and 2027, we are hopeful that this will open up many tangible opportunities for marine research and ocean literacy projects. As a conclusion, today's World Ocean Day is revitalization, collective action for the ocean. What I'm hoping for is that we can all come together and work together to inspire, to connect and advance the construction of tomorrow's society that I hope is a blue society that regenerates and protects the ocean. Te uh, Moana Nui Akiwa, the great Pacific Ocean is right here. Uh, let's start this movement because the ocean is our cradle and it is in our hands to save it, to save ourselves. Nami Hinui, and have a great evening, everyone. Thank you so much, James. Um, I love hearing some of those challenges, but also some of the positive things that are happening. Um, isn't it great that he was able to go and talk with 60 
young children about the ocean and instill in them a sense of empowerment, maybe that they could be part of the change. So that's really good. I actually have four young children. So whenever I am thinking about children, my own are in my mind, you know, age between seven and 14 and what the world will be like for them when they're my age. So um, yeah, really good challenges. Really appreciate that. Thank you, James. Um, our last speaker before we get into the panel um, is Dr. Carol Much, and she is the Education Commissioner for the New Zealand National Commission for UNESCO. So thank you so much for coming and sharing. Good I have some slides. That'll be James. <laughs> I, I don't know Max. <laughs> Well, kia ora koutou, nā mihi nui. Perhaps I'll introduce myself while we're waiting for some slides. I just thought it might be helpful for you to have something to look at, how the audience deal with that, I'm not sure. You may have to turn your heads that way or you may just have to uh, uh, listen to me as I pick the important things out of those slides. So as you heard, um, I'm the uh, Education Commissioner for the National Commission for UNESCO. I'm also a, a professor at the University of Auckland. So it's nice to be able to uh, be here tonight and um, with my thanks to everybody involved, to, to Blue Cradle and to Martin at the centre and everybody who's put this forward. Okay, there we are, yes. So, there we are, that's my welcome. Uh, so now you know who I am and why I'm here. And I'm going to just briefly talk about two things. One is the role of UNESCO, and the other one is what we've got to do with the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science. Okay, so there we are. Um, as you can see, our mission is to um, make the connection between UNESCO internationally and what's happening here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And as you can see, that we do that through building capability, sharing ideas, bringing people together around um, finding a way towards a sustainable, healthy and more peaceful future. And I've taken that little clip off our website, which is bringing the world to Aotearoa and taking Aotearoa to the world. So if you don't know much about the National Commission, um, we various countries choose to look at how they will build their relationship with UNESCO. And in Aotearoa and New Zealand, we have chosen to have a chair and five commissioners who represent five of the important issues that UNESCO deal with. As you can see, culture, social sciences, natural sciences, education and information and communication. And we as... Um, a body that comes together are supported by a secretariat, a wonderful team who sit within the International Division of the Ministry of Education, and they help us do the wonderful things that we're able to do. And so I've just highlighted two of the wonderful things we're able to do. We support UNESCO programs that are operating in New Zealand, and I've selected the Creative Cities Network, Global Geoparks, and Memory of the World. Uh, for a couple of reasons, because it helps you think about ways in which you might want to engage with UNESCO uh, in terms of your interests. At the moment, we have four creative cities. Um, Dunedin is creative city of literature, Wellington creative city of film, Auckland creative city of music, and Whanganui a just newly creative city of design. And so it's a wonderful way of bringing those cities not just together, um, within Aotearoa New Zealand, but linking up with the creative cities around the world. So that's one of our lovely ones. Um, another one that we're doing at, in the next month, we will have the UNESCO um, team coming out to have a look at Waitaki, which is the area around Omaru, where they are applying to be a global geopark. So that's a really exciting thing that's going ahead. And if we flip to the next slide. Sorry. we'll see that um, the UNESCO Memory of the World is a very active one that we have as well, where uh, we take historical documentation, photographs, diaries, letters, and so on, and make those more widely available. Uh, at the bottom of the previous slide, sorry, I, I thought I would have the slides to go backwards and forwards. I just want to 
um, the latest of the, the four things at the bottom there are the very four priorities that we have at the moment. And of course, the reason I'm here is because one of those is oceans for the well-being of people on the planet. And that ties very nicely with some of our other key issues, uh, indigenous knowledges, empowering communities for sustainable futures and freedom of responsible expression. So we have funding available. We make it, um, we have a funding round for people to apply for small projects such as um, our contribution to Blue Cradle this evening in order for these things to be able to go ahead. So again, if you have any interest in those. Thanks, we'll move on past the next slide and on to that one. So as I've said, I'm here because um, it's the decade of ocean science for sustainable development. And uh, we've already heard from James some of the reasons why this is important. So I've just chosen a few there. Um, I really liked his approach about being positive and not seeing this as, you know, as a disaster that we have to, to um, wring our hands about, but celebrate, nurture and value what we already have and then think about how we strengthen, how we build on the strengths and the relationships that we have in order to um, ensure that we can um, preserve this for the future. And finally, do a little bit of problem solving because we do need to engage all of Aotearoa New Zealand in thinking about the very ideas James was talking about. I love the idea of the blue cradle. We're all part of this blue cradle and we need to nurture what we have, so thanks. So what we're doing at the National Commission then is we've taken a, a multidisciplinary approach. Um, while it's a United Nations uh, event going over 10 years, what we're trying to highlight is that you can see this not just through a scientific lens, but you can see this through a community lens, an indigenous lens, a people focused lens. And, um, and that allows us then to celebrate what we have in Aotearoa New Zealand and what we have in the Pacific. Um, we brought together a committee, and the committee has a range of experts, as you can see, from sciences, humanities, indigenous knowledge, as well as from the government, in order to think about the various projects that we can use to go forward. And uh, we've set up a website, and I'll give you the, a link to the website a little bit later, but Te Tini a Tangaroa, of course, a nod to Tangaroa, is a website where we're showcasing many of the activities that we are funding, or supporting in other ways that are to do with the decade of ocean science. And so there's just a couple. I've just taken them off the website, Takawa o Tangaroa. So that is one about sustainable fishing, um, as is the uh, Tyndale Trust. And then the third one as an example is uh, an app for young children to become engaged in thinking about the oceans. So it's worth digging into that website and having a look. And that is where I'll leave it. There is the website. Along the bottom there is the link. Uh, enjoy having a look around that and uh, think of the ways in which you can take an active part in not just today, which is you know Oceans, World Oceans Day, but in this whole decade in terms of making this um, the future that we want for our mokopuna and those who'll come after us. So uh, Nomi, uh, Namahi and um, Kia ora koutou. Thank you so much, Carol. That was really good. And that's a great resource there. So I'm hoping that we can send that around afterwards, maybe. And You're people, most welcome. Yeah, people will be able to click through. And there's a lot more content there than I knew that it was there. So thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, UNESCO is doing a lot in this area, clearly. So it's good to have it. Um, so what we're going to do next is we're going to move into our panel section. Um, but while we're getting our panelists up here, I'd like you to turn to somebody, preferably somebody you haven't met, and you've got 25 seconds to tell them what's one thing that stood out for you so far. And I'll get ask our panelists to come up and sit around here. So find somebody and, and ask them that question. Is that <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to get it. 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 I'm not going
just trying to do ocean education. Yeah. All right. So, I'm Daniel. Oh, okay. while, while you've been while you've been chatting, we magically transformed the front, <laughs> and we now have our panelists here. Um, so, what? Uh, panelists, what I'd like you to pretend is that we're just sitting at a kitchen table and we're just having a conversation. And it just happens to be that there's people here watching and there happens to be people on Zoom who are dialing in using technology. Um, but we're just at a kitchen table. We're having a conversation on these very important topics. Um, so we're really fortunate to have four panelists. Um, and what I'm going to ask each of them is if they can introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about what you're doing. So why don't we start from this side and then we'll move this way. Um, so I believe you've got some slides there, James. Yep. Yep. Okay. So anyway, I'm Anthony Powell. So I've spent the majority of the last uh, 22 years working in Antarctica. So cumulatively, I've got uh, 10 years spent actually down there on the continent. So let me just bring up some pictures here. So of course, when most people think about Antarctica, it's generally just the flat white and yeah, like 95% of it is pretty much like covered in polar ice cap. But as we now know, Antarctica is of course the heart of the ocean. And if we go to the next slide. So I've spent most of my time working at Scott Base. Um, New Zealand's research centre there and in the foreground there you can see the sea ice in front of the base and Scott base itself. And next slide, so I started out working as a telecommunications technician, um, so I worked at both Scott base and McMurdo station as their satellite engineer and doing avionics tech, so I basically came from a technical background <laughs> and then moved more and more into photography and filmmaking as I went along. So next one. So yeah, so, um, so I pretty much learned as I went and um, eventually sort of became known as a very good <coughs> guy for film and um, you know, helped out. Um, I'm on the list of camera people for BBC's Frozen Planet, done a bunch of work for Nat Geo. And of course, my own feature film, the next slide. It's Antarctica Year on Ice, and you can stream it on Amazon Prime. Um, next one. So yes, Antarctica is as cold as you've heard. Uh, the, the coldest temperature ever recorded was at the Russian station uh, Vostok, which was minus 89.2 degrees Celsius ambient without any wind chill. About the coldest stuff personally been out in is probably a bit below minus 60. Plus, I've had um, also been out when it's been about minus 58 uh, Celsius and also blowing at 55 knots, which gives a wind chill well, uh, pretty cold. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much instant frostbite for any slightest bit of frozen skin. So um, next slide. So yes, Antarctica does actually have a lot of color. It's not just black and white. Carry on with the next one. We also have the amazing auroras in the winter. Next one. And the likes of the nacreous clouds. And these can be like small displays, the things that take up the entire sky. And this is actually part of the ozone destruction process when the temperatures hit minus 80 up in the stratosphere. And, the um, PSCs form and that basically acts as a catalyst to eat all the ozone. Uh, next slide. And then of course you've got the wonderful blues when you get inside the glaciers where the, um, this is inside the Erebus ice tongue which is floating out onto the ocean and it tends to crack open in the storms and then form refreeze over the winter so you get all these amazing ice caves. And next one, so yes, we do have very charismatic wildlife. And next one, and um, yes, yeah, so it's both above and below the water. Um, all the wildlife in Antarctica ultimately relies on the oceans uh, for their survival. 
um, the likes of the Woodell seals underneath and many, many more. Next one. But um, yeah, in my time there, I'm actually starting to see more and more changes, um, ice conditions. The, the, we've seen some massive ice shelf loss, sea ice conditions are changing, and it's all a very, very delicate um, sort of a ecosystem there. So, yeah, next one, yeah, so it's me, uh, what's 24 years after I first went down there, and yes, just never get tired of the place. That's great. Thank you, Anthony. That's really good. I love all the visuals. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, so next we have Professor Stephen Ratuba, who's the director of the Macmillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're involved in? Yep. Oh, sorry, I don't have any fancy uh, <laughs> um, slides like that. <laughs> I haven't been to the uh, Antarctica either. I come from a very warm place, Fiji originally, <laughs> and I crossed the ocean. And here I am, overstaying. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, director of the McMillan Brown Center for Pacific Studies, those of you who don't know where it is, it's just the fourth floor. It's about two uh, stories from here. Um, I've been here for, for about six years or seven years. Uh, I was at the University of Auckland before I came down here. And uh, I've been working in different other universities as well around the world in Britain, in the US. and. Uh, also in Australia, uh, in Fiji as well. So uh, uh, I'm kind of interdisciplinary uh, in the sense. I originally grew up as a sociologist and, uh, uh, and political science as well and development studies. And then I move in all directions because I believe that knowledge is uh, interdisciplinary. And what we do in universities is to create little boxes uh, where we uh, artificially uh, construct a little empires. And of course, the ocean tells us that interdisciplinary studies is very, very important. It is to do with economics, it has to do with culture, it has to do with marine life, it has to do with ecology, it has to do with the penguins, it has to do with the snow and beautiful uh, weather down south. And it's uh, increasingly as a result of climate crisis, uh, we, uh, we see the ocean as where a lot of focus should be. And one of the big projects we're working on, we're working on a number of major projects one of which is uh, called the POCA, the Pacific Ocean Climate Crisis and Climate Crisis Assessment, uh, doing a very comprehensive assessment of 16 countries in the Pacific region, just about everything, uh, uh, ranging from social science, humanities, natural science, and indigenous knowledge, uh, funded by MFAC, Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and a few other projects as well. So uh, yeah, we've been quite busy. So uh, we, uh, uh, those of you who are interested in the center, you can come around and we can have more chat. And thank you so much for uh, Blue Cradle. I like the name, I like the term, because uh, uh, in traditional Fijian mythology, the Blue Cradle also relates to uh, being the son and daughter of the ocean. Uh, and that's where we were born. I was born very close to the sea. So I have salt water in my DNA. I'll stop right then. <laughs> That's great. Thank you so much for joining us, and we look forward to your perspectives as we go through. Um, and we're really lucky we have Yvette Couch Lewis here. Um, I know you wear a few different hats, so maybe you can introduce yourself and what you're working on. Well, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko uh, te pō tamate te moka, ko whakadaupō. Mauna. Ko um, Wapaki, Tiraki Pakaputa, Ta Hapu. Ko Naitahu, Ta Iwi. Kia ora, my name is Yvette Couch Lewis. And yes, I do, I wear many, many hats. And for the young poppets here, I want you to try and visualize one great big hat. And out of that is the environment, Kaitiaki. And from that comes many other hats in terms of what we might actually, and roles that we end up actually being within. And over the 20 odd years that I returned home to Rapaki, um, I was living in the big urban cities, enjoying all the 
um, good things that the cities can offer. And then I came home and I came home to retire and I am still not retired. <laughs> so many odd years later that I am still there um, and growing more hats <laughs> as, um, as I head to that one day that I want desperately sometimes to be able to be retired but more importantly, what I want more desperately is for the health, the modi of our whenua, of our moana, and of our why. That is what drives me, and that is what has driven me for the 20 odd years. Also, whakapapa. Whakapapa drives me. I am connected to all of the species. I am connected to the whenua, to the wai, to the moana, to all the species that are within there. We are connected. And what a beautiful image that is. Hey kids, and that would just be just so awesome to be able to start to feel that and that connection that you actually have. My mokupuna, she learns from a very early age that when she goes into the marae, that she can read the marae as she goes in so that she can read her story. She can read her whakapapa and the environment. Tu Raki Whanoa is her kaitiaki. He is mine. Tongaroa is also my kaitiaki. They guide me, they lead me in every decision that I make. So from there, one of the things and what drives me in the different hats that I have on is to have the voice of mana whenua. I want the voice and the values of mana whenua to be heard. We have over 500 years in this uh, country. This has been our home. Now, if people come along and they want to change their home or give different directions in terms of what happens within that home, surely I have every right to be there to be able to make decisions around those changes because it is my home. My tūpuna lead me, my whakapapa leads me, and I have every right to stand firm on my whenua and to swim in my moana and to see the health and the abundance within the moana and on the whenua. One of the main projects, one of my work as Tūmūtai at Environment Canterbury has led me to that point, all the years have led up in working with councils as with putting submissions in, talking about the environment and our values, like I said, that has driven me. And I have watched in particular, I've had over 20 years with Environment Canterbury with the Regional Council and trying to integrate mana whenua values and to have them seen within the planning regulatory framework. That's a long time. 18 months ago, I was appointed as Tumutaio. What motivated me to do that? I look at, quite, at the regional council, they are making moves. They are moving. I liken it to visualizing that may be, they're not quite down in the Arctic, but they're on that glacier and they've got their little toes hanging on the end and they're wanting to step out. I want to be there. I want to help them to be able to do that. Everybody is able to make change within their world. One of the plans that through working with Environment Canterbury 
was that here in Whakadaupo, um, was to actually pull together the Whaka Order Management Plan. And I've been asked to just give a little bit about that plan and how that came about. It came about because of that drive to want to integrate mana whenua values. It came about because we wanted to see change in the planning regulatory framework. That plan is not your normal speak. It is not written in a planning framework. So some people might actually find that a bit difficult to know that we would put that aside. We did it in the concept of a Korowai that took us from the rocky outcrops, from the top of the crater to the middle of the harbour to the ocean floor. And we looked at all the Tonga species that we'd be looking at through there. We worked with our weavers and we started to weave a Korowai and we wrote that plan that way. We wrote it with the, um, the uh, community. It was the community's values that they understood and they wanted. And the community was heard. To be able to move that, and we did that through the Christchurch with the Littleton Port uh, Recovery Plan, that within there, it had to pull together some key organisations like the Littleton, um, sorry, like the Canterbury Regional Council, Littleton Port Company, Te Hapua Nari Whiki, Christchurch City Council and Te Runanga o Naitahu. They came together and they made that decision to be partners and to work together to be in accordance with the philosophy of Kiutiki Tai. And through this partnership, they then walked out and they started to talk to the community to look at, um, <clears throat> sorry, the organization committed to the partnership and within the partnership to create that plan with the community that would aim to restore the ecological and cultural health of Whakadaupo as Mahinga Kai, while also ensuring that other environmental, cultural and social um, concerns such as recreation users, as well as the needs of a working port. We had a, got a huge port there, which you all know, one of the things I remember walking in when we first did this, my first drive was to pull the governance group together and to start getting them to be committed to this mahi. Because if you don't have a committed community, if you don't have committed um, supporters behind you, you're not going to make huge progress. And I went into the chief executive at the time um, in the Littleton Port Company, and I said to him, you know, I'm willing to concede that we're always going to be here, but I'm going to concede that so will you more than likely be here. That to me means that we need to really partner because we're going to be here for a long time. You and I need to talk because if we don't talk, we're not going to get anywhere. So the, our values really conflicted in many ways. But when it came to the Fucker Order Plan, we weren't to conflict. We were to support. When it came to dredging, when it came to other points that within the working port, if Te Hapu or Ngāri Whiki wanted to submit against them, they have every right to do so, just as they have every right not to agree with us. So compromise within the partnership is really, really important to be able to move things forward. So in writing that plan, you have to enable the community. By enabling a community, then you have commitment, you have buy-in of a community that will work. We not only have very committed um, conservationists working great projects that are working within Whakadopal, within the Port Hills, Banks Peninsula. We also have urban, where people come in and out of the tunnel. Their behaviour impacts on our harbour. 
So the users within the harbour, people recognising those users, that how they use their harbour, how they live, how they recreate, how they mix within that area. What happens on the whenua, kitikitai, what happens in the whenua, unfortunately, our wai and our moana receive. Get this right, you'll start to get this right. So <clears throat> one of the couple of the key posts, can I just say, that, that came out from this, they looked at their current state, they looked at their future state in terms of what they want the harbour to look like. Where do we want to live? How do we want to look? You know, one thing we all had in common, mana whenua in the community, we all want to go out and get some pippies. <laughs> We all want to go and get our, take our mokopuna, our grandchildren, and go down and fish. No matter what ethnic group you come from, you all want those values. You all want to be able to swim. You all want to recreate within that water, within that harbour. Then let's work together and let's do it together. So... In doing that, within the plan, we encourage the people to be good cha change makers. Only they could be the changes. Only change would come about from them. Why are we doing it? We are doing it for the next generation. That's why we're doing it, for these young ones that are sitting here. That's why we do it. And when we do it in collaboration, it can't be done on our own. We must do it together. So from there, to be able to achieve that future state that they wanted, what was it they had to address? It was erosion, sedimentation, pollution, terrestrial biodiversity and marine biodiversity. Those are the, all coming together to start to address those areas to get to their future state. And finally, Really important for mana whenua. You know, mana whenua have some really good management tools. Rahui, Mataitai, Taipuri. We forget them when we start looking at reserves. We stay within the context of what we know. But mana whenua have really good management tools. Rāpaki had the first matai in New Zealand, and that matai was just out front. Matai tais look after the uh, the traditional fishing um, sites, and now the role of mana whenua was to start to look after those sites because we saw how our harbour was degrading and the loss that we had in terms of our traditional uh, fishing grounds. So we brought forth a matai tai, and it was passed, it was legislated. And then in 2017, we increased it from being outside Rāpaki, outside the marae, and we took it further, and we took it to the reef and further. Now we have uh, now got before us now the, the men, and it's, funny enough, it is the men and sometimes the women, like myself, I put my toes into the water and they look at me when I go down and says, well, come on, what's going on here goes on up here. You know, and we had that kind of debate. It's good and it's healthy. But <clears throat> that matai tai, now <clears throat> they have applied to the Ministry for Primary Industry to extend the harbour, to extend that matai tai, and we're extending it all the way out to the head of the harbour, out to Godly Head, out to Awara. What are the benefits of that? A matai tai brings about a management plan within there. This extension was done in consultation with all the communities within the harbour. It's not mana whenua going off on their own. It's not about mana whenua's fishing rights and them having to do that. It is for everyone we will all benefit. What did I say to begin with? We all have the same values. We all want to fish. We all want cockles and pippies from the harbour. We all want to go for a swim. We want to be in our kayaks and have the Hector's dolphins swimming alongside us. 
We want to see when the re when the um, the wreck are running. We want to be able to see the um, oh the the killer whale. I forget their names. Just blocked me. Coming in, coming in, and and swooping in amongst those the flocks of fish that are there and eating them as they're going through. Seeing their mighty fins. That's what we want to see. When I see a hectares dolphin and a pepe that's at the head of the harbour, I know my harbour's getting healthier. That's what encourages me. So what makes me a kaitiaki and have all of those little hats is exactly that. Kia ora and thank you for the opportunity um, to uh, Blue Cradle for inviting me here today and to just put a little mana whenua touch to the conversation. Kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Great. Thank you so much, Hubert. I love that. And I love the, the, um, the reminder of the connectedness that we as humans have. Sometimes we think of nature as a separate thing, but we ourselves are part of nature. And that sometimes gets lost. So thank you. It's really, really good thoughts for us. Um, how many of you have been to Australia? How many of you have been to the Great Barrier Reef? A few. So our final panelist is Dr. Dr. Vivian Cumbo. <laughs> and I'd love to hear about what you're doing because it's a very interesting focus. You're the Senior Project Program Manager at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation, Resilient Reefs. So tell us a little bit about that. That's right. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, as you said, I'm uh, Vivian Cumbo. Um, my background is actually in coral reef research. I was a um, researcher for 15 years before I moved across to work at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation um, on a program called the Resilient Reefs Initiative. Now, the Resilient Reefs Initiative is actually a global initiative um, where we partner with reef managers and reef communities and global experts to try and find new solutions to tackle and uh, climate change and local threats. Now, our aim is actually to build resilience into uh, the reef ecosystem, but also the communities that they support um, so that they can survive, adapt well, and recover to uh, global or local stresses um, such as uh, coral bleaching or pollution or overfishing or um, shock events such as uh, a cyclone coming through and knocking out a reef. Um, and so we do this. Um, currently, we're piloting this um, initiative at uh, five World Heritage listed sites. Four of them we um, are actively implementing there. So that is um, in Ningaloo in Western Australia and in Palau in Belize and in New Caledonia. And our fifth site is the Great Barrier Reef where we're more partnership with them. Now, um, the way that we're trying to build resilience into the reefs and the communities that they support is through four key pillars. Um, the first is um, developing a leadership role that um, we fund and create a leadership role that is actually embedded within the reef management authorities at that location. And we find this is a really important step to do by embedding it into um, the reef management authorities. That means they have more ownership over the work that's being done. Um, they have uh, more resilience. At, this helps to build their resilience thinking and planning. Um, and it also helps to build um, the capacity of the reef managers at that site. Um, the second pillar um, is that we focus on is strategic planning. So we help um, by providing the tools and resources so that the, um, that position, which is called the Chief Resilience Officer, um, them and their local partners at the site can utilise these tools and resources so that they can then connect with uh, First Nations peoples or um, the community or industry partners or any other stakeholders and actually engage and find out, okay, what are the challenges at this site? What is it that we need to address? And they get everyone's, they hear everyone's advice and opinions and they start developing an idea about the resilient challenges at the site. They then go and write this holistic um, resilience strategy. And the whole idea of this um, holistic resilience strategy is to have a prioritised set of actions which will help to ensure that they're building resilience into the ecosystem, the governance structure and the community. So we call it this framework with those three key areas. 
Um, and the fourth pillar that we have um, is obviously funding. And so we um, provide um, funding for the sites to try and um, act to action and implement, sorry, to implement these actions so that they can actually do on the ground work and start building resilience into their sites. Um, so, oh, did I just say fourth? Did I forget the third? I think I did. <laughs> I'll skip, I'll go back one. We also have a third pillar, which is um, we don't expect the sites to be able to do this all by themselves. We provide a lot of resources through global experts. So um, we have we connect our sites to the other sites that are going through all the same learnings as well. And we also um, connect them to um, specific experts on certain actions. But we also have what we call a knowledge network, which is a formalised partnership that we have with the Nature Conservancy um, Res Reef Resilience Network, uh, UNESCO and Columbia University's Resilient Cities and Landscapes. And so with all of them, they, they, they help to get these, this work off the ground and action and implement it. And so that's my role at the moment. Thanks for that. <laughs> All right, so we're going to come back to each of you and ask a kind of targeted question related to what you're each involved in. But I do have a question just at a high level, and we're reflecting on our theme, which is revitalization, collective action for the ocean. So I'm wanting a rapid fire answer from each of you. And it's, it's a simple question, probably a complicated answer, but we'll do our best. So Vivian, starting with you. What, in your view, would be the single most important or powerful action that we could work on to protect and restore the ocean? Okay, my answer to that would be um, ensuring that you integrate resilience-based management strategies into um, management plans. So that's the really short answer. <laughs> but, but, but essentially what I mean by that is, so resilience-based management strategies look at um, the current and future um, projections um, and how this will impact um, the ecosystem function. And so by having this knowledge, it helps us then determine, okay, what should we prioritise? It's, it's making us nimble and adaptive. Um, traditional management plans at the moment, then they don't have that nimble and adaptiveness, which means we can't respond as effectively um, in this ever-changing environment. So mm, that's great. Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> How about you, Yvette? What's, what's your response? The single most powerful action we can work on to protect and restore the ocean. <clears throat> to be able to look holistically and to be able to work holistically. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. However, working with mana whenua as well in terms of matauranga Māori, as I said, we've been here for 500 years or more, generations of knowledge and expertise in watching their environment flourish, degrade, and start to come build it back through. We work in a society that is focused like this. In Te Ao Māori, we look like this, from the mountains to the sea. Remember what I said before, unfortunately, the water is the receiving. You cannot fix the water without addressing the above. Look holistically, work holistically. Great, thank you. Stephen, same question to you. <laughs> what is the single most powerful action we can work on to protect and restore the ocean? Yes, strategic partnership and connections between people on the ground mm -hmm. uh, in the community, as already said, and the use of indigenous knowledge and other forms of knowledge together with states, together with civil society, together with uh, research institutions, and of course, the corporate sector, which does a lot of damage to the environment and, uh, uh, and how you create um, a sense of uh, uh, understanding of what um, everyone is doing and being able to commit to the common goal and making sure that the ocean uh, regenerates itself and uh, in a sustainable manner for everybody. 
That's great. Thank you. And Anthony? Well, aside from um, sustainable management of the oceans, I would have to say getting to a carbon neutral society as fast as possible, because um, ultimately Antarctica is pretty much the canary in the coal mine and the canary's fallen off the perch at this stage. Mm. Yep. Thank you. Um, now, Vivian, when I was a child, a similar age to some of the young people here, actually, I think I was seven or eight years old, and I remember going to the Great Barrier Reef, and it was just astoundingly beautiful because the colors, the vibrant, the, you know, the life, I think it's one of the, one, you know, you can see it from space, can't you? It's, it's huge. Can you tell us, um, can we save the reef, and what role will education play in that? And also, what are your feelings? Kind of two-part question. There is a new government in Australia. What's, is any dynamics gonna change as a result of that? Sure, so I would just like to say similar experience. I saw the reef for the first time when I was 14 years old and that is why I'm a marine biologist. I literally got in the water and was like, wow, this is stunning. I'm gonna work on this. Um, so uh, to answer your question on can we save the reef? Um, so just a quick recap of what's happened this year in our La Nina year. Um, we've actually had uh, another mass coral bleaching event in March, um, which is unfortunate. Um, we've seen severe bleaching over large swaths of the reef. Uh, now it takes about 10 years for a coral reef ecosystem to recover completely from a bleaching event. And this is our, our fourth coral bleaching event in the last six years, mass coral bleaching event. So um, all hope is definitely not lost on whether we can save the reef. We've definitely got a lot of bright minds out there working on ways to um, maintain and preserve the reef. And this is exactly what we're doing at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. Every single program at the Great Barrier Reef Foundation is looking at ways to address this issue. Um, and I just want to highlight two of the flagship programs that we have. One of them is the Resilient Reefs Initiative that I'm a part of, and that is the holistic approach, looking at how to build capacity, how to um, look at governance structures, how to build in resilience thinking. Um, the other uh, flagship program is the Reef Restoration and Adaptation Program, otherwise known as RAP. Now, this one is much more of a research and development program. Um, it's looking at new technologies to address um, the issues of saving the reef, whether it's technologies of preventing uh, coral bleaching, so preventing so uh, cooling or shading the environment, or adaptation technologies, which are um, helping corals to adapt and evolve to the ever-changing conditions or whether it's restoration technologies um, to help restore a degraded or damaged reef. Um, so yes, we can totally save, we could totally help to save the reef when there's people working on it now. Um, second part of the question about education. Yeah, that's fine too. Yeah. Always, oh, education oh, is always yeah, a good so topic. I, I think, yeah, so education um, definitely uh, is a really important part of this. Um, we definitely find that by going out and just educating the community about the situation, uh, it, it, helps, it, it helps in behaviour change, it helps in how they interact with their um, natural environment, and it also um, makes them champions for the reef as well. They, um, you end up with genuine partnerships that actually want to help management agencies as well uh, and the last question was about the election so I don't know whether <laughs> anyone knows that Australia's got a new government now we've now got a Labor government um, and so this election was definitely dubbed the climate change election we saw a huge shift in voter preference um, towards um, candidates that spoke about climate change and um, this is a really exciting time in Australia and so any government that has um, positive action on climate change will have a really positive impact on the reef. So I'm really excited and hopeful for this new government. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. And I want to jump from Australia to Antarctica. Can you, because the photos that you shared with us before, like they were stunningly beautiful. What, what role, I guess, do you see that technology using photos maybe different ways of communicating what it's like there. Um, do you see that as a future pathway to getting people on board with protecting 
Yeah, it's, I think in today's society, it's actually really hard to get people's attention with um, social media becoming faster and faster, trying to distill vast amounts of information down into little tiny sound bites. So um, one thing that I've found that works really well is yeah, put up some really attention grabbing imagery, get their attention and um, with, with the candy and feed them a few vegetables on the side sort of thing. Um, <laughs> With, with kids, um, very, um, very strong advocate for um, the likes of taking them out to visit the Antarctic Centre here, like um, was done earlier today. Um, I remember when I was a kid, I can still pretty much remember all the field trips I, I did at school, um, the day-to-day -day life, I can remember hardly anything. So a lot of that sort of stuff is the stuff that really sticks in mind, makes a long-term difference in education. Um, I'm also very much pushing the limits of technology and a lot of the stuff that I do in terms of uh, virtual reality, um, new ways of engaging people that they haven't seen before. So um, that the new ways of presenting things, um, yeah, really helps uh, convey a lot of the information. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and um, a reminder, we're going to have some Q&A after this, so I want to get you thinking now, be storing up your questions. We're going to turn to that soon. Um, Yvette, I, I really loved what you had to share in terms of Mana Fenua and the relationship with nature and things. Looking around the room, I think there's probably quite a few Pakeha people in this room. Can you help us? Um, what would be ways that we can be allies or um, stand stand with you, stand with this message of um, looking to Mana Whenua for answers as well? Because I think all, probably all of us would say, this sounds good, but what are some practical things that we can also do ourselves? Um, Kaitiakitanga is actually a new term. Our kaitiaki, we were never kaitiaki. Our environment gave us the messages. Our birds, our fish, the tides, they were the messengers. They were the ones that told us when we should go and gather, when we shouldn't gather. But because our environment has degraded so much, we have now become kaitiaki. We are now the guardians because it is up to us now to protect and to look after those species, those images of once what were. And I just want you to think about that term, kaitiaki, stewardship. And for me, that is the one way that we can all do it together. Again, it's about working together. We can all be kaitiaki. We can all share the way that we do things and, and how we use our land and our resources. We are all kaitiaki. And I live for the day, I won't see it, and I don't think my granddaughter will see it. I think her children might. The day that we are no longer kaitiaki. But it is a term that Pākehā do understand. So in a very short, brief one, I would go kaitiaki. We are all kaitiaki. But let's all work together to give it back to our oceans. Kia ora. Thank you. That's great. And Stephen, turning to you as well with a question, you've worked at this intersection point of education and um, particularly people from the Pacific coming here, people from here going to the Pacific, what, what would you see as an ideal best case scenario for, from a Pacific perspective when we're looking at these questions? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, uh, the Pacific is fundamentally, uh, well, it's the biggest, biggest ocean in the world and it defines the identity 
uh, the history of the Pacific people is actually the history associated with the ocean as it traveled for thousands of miles as far as South America. They brought back the Kumara and they took the coconuts there even before Columbus. So it very much defines the identity and the social connection with the cosmology, with themselves, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, source of their livelihood. And uh, also in recent years, uh, it's a way of defining the political, uh, if you like, context and identity. Uh, although the Pacific Island states are regarded often, the referred to as small island states, and when in fact they are big ocean states, when you add the 200 mile EZ, you can take the whole of Europe and dump it in Kiribati and it sinks. <laughs> uh, and this is a very big, uh, so in terms of that bigness, that's what we bring into the table in terms of negotiation over the ocean mm. and talking about climate change. Uh, and of course, it is a huge carbon sink, uh, which is relevant to the discussion on climate crisis. Uh, we no longer call it climate change, it's a crisis uh, because far beyond the normal changes as a result of human intervention over the years. So, uh, and of course, complex relationship between uh, the politics of the ocean, uh, which, as you know, over the years, the Pacific has been used for nuclear testing, for instance, and for colonial demarcation of, of lines of, uh, of borders. Uh, and uh, for geopolitical contestation, of course, now the channel on one hand, and the Indo-Pacific alliance, uh, the Anglo-Western world on the other. So we caught the Pacific Ocean, which is supposed to be, I don't know about Spanish, but it's supposed to mean peaceful ocean. Yeah, peaceful ocean. But of course, over the years, we've seen turbulence in terms of geopolitics. Yeah, so. Uh, there's so much that we bring to the table and to Aotearoa in terms of the Pacific uh, when we talk about the ocean and the ocean evolves and we evolve with it as well. Mm. And can you just mention the Pacific Ocean and Climate Crisis Assessment, which you're involved in? Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it's a, it, it's a huge uh, uh, project funded by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. We partner with uh, the University of South Pacific as our partner in the region and uh, also uh, with other uh, important stakeholders, <coughs> regional organizations, civil side organizations. We have up to uh, about 70 uh, researchers who are involved from all around the region. While the focus is on doing assessment of 16 countries in the region, that's about every country we can think of, including East Timor. Uh, the, uh, there are also fundamental ideological and political assumptions ar around it. One is to do with the voices of, uh, if you like, the minority uh, groups in the world. Now, the uh, Paris uh, Agreement talks about indigenous knowledge as being an important component of addressing climate change. The IPCC only talk about indigenous knowledge in its last report. It's always been driven by the uh, global north scientists, not so much the global south scientists, and let alone indigenous scholars. So this is an opportunity to bring the voices of the, if you like, the subaltern, the term used by sociologists uh, in the Pacific as part of the bigger global debate, because uh, the narratives of climate is not only environmental, it is very political as well. <clears throat> Some people define the narratives and others follow, when in fact we want to decolonize uh, the process through this particular project. So it's very interdisciplinary. It covers virtually every aspect of uh, human life from uh, uh, their coastal management systems to economic livelihood, to biodiversity, to the ocean, the reefs and so forth, to uh, uh, culture uh, and the loss of uh, their people's sense of identity as a result of, uh, you know, transportation from one island to another or to another part of the world. So it's kind of very, very comprehensive and interconnected in that sense. That's wonderful. Well, that, that's kind of a theme that's come through all of our speakers, I think, is this the interconnected nature of what each of us are doing and even the connection between Antarctica and the Great Barrier Reef. Like it's all it's all connected, isn't it? Um, so what we'd like to do is open up for some questions. Um, so if anyone has a question, maybe you can raise your hand and we'll go around the room. Yes, go ahead. 
Um, kia ora to the panel. Um, I just wanted to pick up on what you, Professor Ratova, was saying about um, corporations and the like that are, <clears throat> have a negative effect on um, the climate and on the oceans. Um, and I'd assume that, that we all here are people who kind of understand the challenge that we have and understand what needs to be done to um, kind of restore the ocean and, and the, the environment. But for those organisations, those corporations, or even those states that don't understand, either to a point of indifference or just don't agree that we should do anything to change, what are the ways that you think that we could bring them on board? Because the people who get it, get it, and they're doing the work, we're all doing the work. But for those who don't agree, uh, what are the ways that we can convince them, persuade them? Very good question, but very big as well. <laughs> I think the answers are somewhere here, <laughs> somewhere there. Uh, during the COP26, uh, I think the largest delegation were these corporations, energy corporations for lobbying. Uh, you must have heard of the term uh, pirate climate state, and Australia was part of it until the last election, <laughs> uh, hopefully. Uh, and Brazil and, and China and Saudi Arabia and so forth, so it's trying to push back. Uh, and a lot of those uh, is the, the result of the corporations. Like, uh, I mean, of course, in Australia, you have the mining corporations and you have uh, Robert Murdoch's uh, media empire, which is kind of pushing back on that, which also owns the New Zealand Herald. Uh, the New Zealand Herald has a very anti climate, some, every now and then it comes out, some of the stuff which they write. So, uh, uh, and was it towards the end of last year? I was invited. Uh, to go and uh, give a, a speech to the uh, New Zealand Pacific Business Council to talk to them about their role, the role of corporations, particularly operating the Pacific, in relation to uh, 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 carbon emission and to climate change. And uh, they said they were going to invite me again, but they haven't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they must be thinking, oh, if we do what this guy's talking about, then we're going to have no profit whatsoever. <laughs> but of course, a lot of the... Uh, uh, but of course, in the mindset of uh, big corporations, of capitalism, of new liberalism, is that you've got to make profit at the end. And there's a lot of big shift by these corporations through greenwashing by making money. Not so much they love the planet so much that they're going towards green energy, but because that's where they make money from, electric cars and so forth. But of course, the need for electric cars, uh, name any company you know, into that, uh, what do you need? Uh, you need uh, rare metals for electrical, you know, operation of machines and all those things. Mm -hmm. Where is it? Uh, it's in the Pacific, uh, in the seabed mining and so forth. Kind of this cycle of having to extract from nature. You stop one and then you start another one. Um, and of course, uh, uh, they have committed trillions of dollars of big corporations in the COP26 uh, for the next few years. But again, uh, a lot of it has to do with kind of greenwashing. They want to make sure there's seem to be conscious members of uh, the human society, of, of humanity. Uh, it's a marketing tool as well, if you seem to be uh, you know, having green, particularly green boxes and so forth. Uh, but I think things are changing uh, in the minds of the corporations. They know that they can no longer exist where they are. Like cigarette, for instance, at some point in the 1960s, they were paying for lawyers and academics to, to reinterpret the data so that uh, 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 cancer has nothing to do with uh, uh, cigarette. Uh, same thing with climate. They were paying for scientists um, in the early days, up until now, to reinterpret the data. Uh, but unfortunately, but, but more and more, the data is so convincingly against them that they're beginning to shift. At one point, I think in the 1980s, I was estimated like some, it was like 50-50. 50% of the scientists um, uh, said that, yeah, climate change is happening, and 50% said no. But now it's about 98 to 99%. It's kind of shifted a lot. So uh, soon they will start throwing in the towel. They're already throwing in the towel, but bit by bit, they're beginning to shift. Yeah. But not, maybe not, it's not fast enough. But some countries uh, in Europe, I know, where companies are really moving in a big way towards that. And New Zealand still has to do it. We have our farms, we have, uh, big, you know, uh, we are still at a very kind of early stage of having to get the business into the process.
Yeah, great question. I think we could probably go on for a long time on that one. Um, I am encouraged by the fact that people are becoming more aware of social washing and that consumers are making choices, maybe thinking about yeah. what they're buying and things. So that's it. there are encouraging signs. Um, if people on Zoom, you're welcome to put in chat as well um, and we can answer any other questions. Any other questions from this room though? Just going back, sorry. Go ahead. Just going back to uh, coral bleaching and the Great Barrier Reef. When um, when that happened to a big swath of the reef, does that mean you said ten years it takes to recover? Does that ten years kind of start when the bleaching has happened, or does that sometimes mean that that will never recover once that event has happened? The reef always has a really good ability to recover. It's just as long as there is um, source populations of coral to aid that recovery. So. As we've said, everything is connected. So if there is sections of reef that haven't actually been bleached and they're healthy and they're still reproducing, corals release their eggs and sperm into the water column and they create larvae in the water column and then they're moved along currents. And so these larvae can actually be transported to the degraded reefs um, and then uh, the reef can start to recover. Um, but that section of reef that's been bleached it won't be reproductively active, it won't be, and, and, and you can actually start seeing a bit of a shift as well because uh, a healthy reef is supporting so much biodiversity and that um, disappears and takes a long time to come back until the reef structure is back again because the reef structure is like the houses for the other organisms. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So do these bleaching events, they generally happen, but now they're happening so much more frequently? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the... So there was a bleaching event, like a re the first mass bleaching event, I'm going to get started wrong now. The first mass bleaching event was in 1998. The next one was in like 2002. And then we've had like 2016, 2017 now and two years ago. And they've been really big and they've been back to back. And so, and we're losing different sections. So when I say large swaths of the reef, each time a different section of the reef is actually bleached worse. So sometimes the northern section, sometimes it's the midsection. South section's been fairly good recently. It's avoided the worst of it, which is good, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Great questions. Any other questions for the room? Or James, you've got one on Zoom. Yeah, so I got a question from Ursula, who's asking, so she says, we can easily reach the children, but how can we convince older people across cultures that the ocean is important. Okay, Yvette or Anthony, do you want to lead off on that? Um, yeah, um, changing minds on older people is a very difficult thing, I think. Um, that's why I think a lot of things like cigarette smoking and climate change basically takes a generation or so before we'll see any really significant difference. Like we knew about climate change in the 1980s, then there was all the you know disinformation that's even going on now and it was basically through education of younger people that we're now starting to get results we're starting to get people to um act with their vote which is the one thing that's going to make politicians do things um so yeah it's um yeah just appealing emotionally rather than intellectually a lot of the time works as well which is why I try and craft um, stuff that you can react to emotionally when you see things. That's great. You have any thoughts on that one? Um, I wouldn't advocate for this to happen, particularly, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, one of the most positive things that have come out of the pandemic is that New Zealanders have got out and they have started to look at their own country. Businesses have increased. There are have business, some businesses have done really well because New Zealanders have been putting money back into their homes. They are traveling within their own country. The power of sight, the power of doing. How do we start to change people? We don't need another pandemic, please, no. <laughs> but get out and experience your country before you go overseas. That is where, yeah, yeah, I think that's enough, yeah. That's great. 
All right, we're coming to a close. So any final questions or you got one there? Yeah, I've got one from Camille who says, uh, there are many brilliant organizations out there doing great things for the ocean. Um, it is accepted that collaborating is the best way forward. What does this look like um, for the general public? What practical steps can we take to aid in collaborating and promoting the role of Kaikiaki? Okay, great question. Why don't we have, this might be the final one because we're getting to the end. So do you each want to share a thought on that? Uh, I think, yeah, get involved. Um, make sure you get out there and get informed and educated about it as well. And then, and then you, you know what's out there and you know how to help um, is my, my biggest thing. Hmm. I think it's a combination of, of all. I, I want to go back to Littleton, over to the Whakawater plan, and that is that looking at, um, you know, one of the challenges I put to the senior managers group is that we have all these amazing people that are already doing it. We don't have to convert them. It's the people in the urban communities that come in and out of that tunnel and how they use um, Littleton um, and those effects on the on Whakadopo, the receiving environment. And one of the thoughts that we had in a discussion that we had, you know, there's these amazing bricks that are under, sorry, I'm, I, I fall into telling stories, that, <laughs> that there's these bricks that they have, um, you know, when the Europeans first arrived, when they started to channel um, the waterways and the water just comes rushing down them. And I said, wouldn't that be an amazing thing to actually start opening them up? Instead of putting concrete through them, we actually start putting rocks into them and start telling the story of the, of the kōkapu that comes in, it migrates all the way up these these pipe these um, barrels to the top to the wetland. Get the kids to do the wetland. Open up. People have got barrels under their houses. They don't even know that's in their gardens. Why don't we open them up and let people see them and see what is in there? How do we involve the urban people? Give them something to look at. Give them something to look after. Be kaitiaki of that little wee piece of barrel that's got these fish swimming up. Just look after that bit. That is enough for me to be able to do that. Look within your community. There are a lot of things that you can use within the community to start encouraging. Stormwater, having their own tanks planting natives as opposed to planting exotics. That's what we're looking for. Kia ora. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just briefly, I think one of the, uh, one of the biggest uh, uh, enemies of, uh, um, of, you know, trying to transform, uh, you know, things that we're talking about is isolation and the lack of connectivity. In our project, we realized that uh, there's so many groups already in existence all over the place in the Pacific, for instance, uh, who are doing stuff on climate crisis on the ocean. They too are trying to reach out to find out who's doing what. Uh, and they need that connection and they need to be involved and part of a network as well. So again, it's very, very important uh, to have that kind of connection, not only within countries regionally and globally, uh, across disciplines, and often scientists, academics like us, we work in little silos. We have to break those silos. We think that we are no better until we realize we jump out of ivory tower into the real world and say, oh my God, I know very little. Uh, so uh, it's important to uh, uh, kind of connect and get rid of those little silos and isolation and begin to realize that there are also people like us who are trying to reach out to us. And then you create kind of global uh, it was only recently uh, that I uh, had a visit from uh, Blue Cradle that, oh, uh, you exist? Uh, yes, yes, uh, we, you exist too? Yes, yes, we exist. <laughs> so, uh, and then now we realize that there's coexistence. 
That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say, I'd say um, always be willing to help out, um, make make those um, engagements with other people, other groups, um, you know, um, for helping out with the education, um, finding the common ground, the common points of interest that you can then expand on and just help people understand what it's all about. That's great. All right. Well, I think you'll agree it's been a fascinating evening hearing a lot of very diverse perspectives, people doing some amazing, inspiring work. Um, as a, with a different hat, I do a podcast called Seeds, and I can guarantee I could have talked to each of you for at least an hour <laughs> on the work that you're doing, because it's really fascinating, amazing things. So um, I want to say a particular note as we're finishing to Blue Cradle and to James and Natasha for kind of catalyzing this, bringing it together. Um, I'm not sure if James can say this as easily, so I will for him. Blue Cradle is a charity and it's set up to organize and educate. And so if you're not signed up to their newsletter, why not sign up? Look for ways you can support the work that they're doing because it's really important. And this type of thing um, will help more people to be aware. Um, I want to say thank you to every speaker who we've had. Um, thank you to Anthony, to Stephen, to Yvette, and um, I just everybody who's been here. Um, Vivian, I'm just looking <laughs> here. Uh, we also had Carol and we had Martin at the beginning sharing with us. So thank you, everybody who shared. Um, it was awesome to hear your perspectives, to hear um, those different views and different ways of looking at this important topic on the ocean and looking at what the future will hold. So for those of you, oh, go ahead and <laughs> So for those of you who are still here, we are gonna be having some drinks and some nibbles after this. So feel free to stick around and, and have conversations. And let's try to break out of our silos. Let's talk to somebody we haven't spoken to before and let's try to get more connected because that is how we're gonna achieve um, more through sharing and working together. But thank you everybody for coming. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so when's the next? <laughs> <laughs>